In the next few minutes, what we'll be uh, talking is the, what are the surgical options and the surgical problem, problems in pediatric hip uh, disorders. And it's a bit of continuation of the two lectures that you had this morning. Uh, Gavin spoke about principles of femoral or proximal femoral osteotomies. There are many things here that are similar, but in the uh, pediatric populations. I'll be talking mostly about the pelvic osteotomy, the principle, the guidelines, and if you still have time, we'll continue to include other uh, disorders. So why we are talking so much emphasis on the hip joint? Well, it's a huge joint. It's the second biggest in the body, it plays a major role in gait and ambulation. Uh, it supports the trunk on the lower limbs, important for sitting, positioning in case uh, someone, neuromuscular patient using a wheelchair. It's important hygiene, uh, toileting. So it has a key role in all daily uh, activities, mobility, independence, and quality of life. Any anomaly or pathology that affects it, affects not only the hip joint, but it affects your quality of life and independence. Therefore, we as orthopedic surgeons, we can do a lot to help these people. You have heard in the adult population, you will hear now in children what we can do. We have the tools, we have the techniques to restore the normal anatomy in many cases, restore the normal biomechanics in, no, in some cases, and in case that we cannot restore this, still there are surgical options that we can do uh, to help uh, this patient. So the objectives of all this conference really, it's how to approach various hip problems in children and develop a problem list. This problem list is equivalent to what Gavin said uh, this morning, a, a surgical strategy. So both are the same uh, thing. So what is the problem list? And I repeat, it's a surgical strategy. So first thing, identify what is the problem. And that's by the history and physical. What is the cause of the problem? And that it's a radiological assessment. And then what are the expectations of the patient and the family? What are the goals of the surgical intervention? Do they meet the expectations? They don't meet the expectation? Are the expectations of the family simply out of reality or not? And once you have decided what's the goal based on the expectation, the problems and history and physical, then how can we reach these goals? And here we'll talk about the surgical options. So the first thing before we go into the various scenario, what is the problem? And that is defined by history and physical. And all these are basic things that you should do every time that you examine not only the hip, but essentially any uh, joint starting with, uh, uh, is the problem localized to the hip? Is it part of a systemic problem? We are going to see one of the scenarios, for example, if it's skeletal dysplasia or other disorders. And then these are the main thing or the presenting complaints that you will have to address as part of the uh, treatment. The second uh, thing now is what is the cause of the problem? Uh, this means that it's analysis of the deformity, if you want, and that's the radiological assessment and imaging, and we'll mention this uh, quickly. Uh, the uh, radiological assessment for a hip, if you have a systematic approach, where is the pathology? Is it in the acetabulum? Is it in the proximal femur? Or is it in both? It's very simple. However, that's the way we teach our uh, residents. And essentially, you go where the money is. It doesn't make any sense if you have an acetabular dysplasia to treat it with a proximal femoral osteotomy. I'm talking basic things. There are instances where it changes. Nothing is black and white. But in general, you address where the money is. <coughs> then there are three things that you should analyze. And again, that's how I was taught, and that's how I teach to read a hip x-ray. First thing, there are certain acetabular angles that you have to measure which is acetabular index, sharp index, so seal will see the diagrams very quickly. After the acetabulum, you analyze the proximal femur, and you have angles and things that you have to document. And then, what is the relation between the proximal femur and the acetabulum? 
And these are the things also that I will mention. So if you have a system, whenever you read an x-ray, then you will never forget it. And you should uh, really describe these three, acetabulum, proximal femur, and the relation between uh, the two. The radiological assessment, there are various uh, uh, techniques to do. The gold standard still remains a plain x-rays. So the first thing, we'll go through the acetabulum. The two most important are acetabular index and the sharp index. And these are the two that will tell us if there is any dysplasia uh, or not. Acetabular index of Hilgen Reiner, you draw the Hilgen Reiner uh, angle, which is the upper part of the triradiate cartilage, and then an angle perpendicular to it, and that is the acetabular index. By the age of two, it should be 20 degrees. Easy to remember, 220. The next thing, and that's how you measure it. Now, if the triradiate cartilage is uh, closed, then it's the sharp acetabular angle, which is between the lower part of the third drop towards the tip of the acetabulum and the horizontal line. And that should be uh, around that value. So these two values will simple, will tell you if there is an acetabular dysplasia uh, or not. And again, my talk, it's a pediatric talk. I'm not talking about the adult. Uh, areas how to examine them. The next thing in the proximal femur, neck shaft angle extremely important. Uh, it was mentioned this morning by uh, James Fernandez that the greater trochanter ossifies completely around the age of eight or nine. So before that age, you cannot apply the proximal femoral angle values because it's not yet ossified. So really the neck shaft angle is a very uh, important femoral antiversion, and then coxa magna, coxa breva, and the greater trochanter, it's the articular trochanteric distance, we'll see it in one second. So the first thing, the neck shaft angle, the normal value, it's around 130, it keeps decreasing from a birth, anything below 105, 110 is considered the coxa vara. Uh, another angle that is important is the Hilgenreiner epiphyseal uh, angle if you have a developmental coxa vara, and uh, this angle here, it is very important also to measure. Articular trochanteric distance, it's something uh, very important that we consider specifically when we treat coxa vara or other uh, deformities. And its importance is that the distance between the tip of the trochanter and the upper part of the femoral head is very important. If it is decreased, like if you have a high riding trochanter, the abductor muscle shortens, your abductor lever arm increases, and that causes a Trendelberg gait and pain. You can have a high riding trochanter with a normal neck shaft angle. You can have a high riding trochanter with a coxa breva, coxa magna, so it's two different uh, things, and that's where you have a combination of both the neck shaft angle and the proximal femoral angle if the greater trochanter is fully uh, ossified. The next thing now, you finished measuring the stabulum, finished proximal femur, what is the relation between the two? Extremely important, because that will tell you if there is a subluxation or not, and if anything needs to be treated. The amount of femoral head coverage, you have anterior and lateral. The lateral, you measure the center and edge angle of Weiberg, center of the femoral head vertically to the tip here of the acetabulum, and that is the value how it is. And the more lateral uncovering of the femoral angle, the central edge angle of Weiberg will be decreased. You measure your anterior coverage with the false profile view, and that's the technique of how to take a, a false profile view about 65 degrees and the cassette is uh, here. And that measures the anterior coverage. You have here, it's a normal false profile view and here you have a decreased and here it's almost nothing. So this you measure the anterior and you measure the lateral uh, coverage. Three other important things. Extremely important, the Shenton's line, because that line will tell you if there is any subluxation or not. Third drop, extremely important, and the sourcil. And with these three, then you complete your uh, radiological, essentially, assessment. Here you find that the Shenton's line, which is the lower border 
obturator foramen with the medial part of the femoral neck, it should be continuous. Any disruption means that there is a subluxation of the femoral head. One last thing, it's AP in abduction and internal rotation. An extremely valuable x-ray in uh, PEDS, in, in pediatric orthopedics. And if you, if you look at here, at this x-ray, that's a normal value, normal Shenton's line. Here, Shenton's line is broken. There is some acetabular dysplasia. Bef it has to be, something has to be done. You cannot leave an acetabular dysplasia like this. But should you do also a femoral osteotomy or not? AP abduction view, the hip is very well centered. Shenton's line is restored. This means that you should do a pelvic osteotomy to correct the dysplasia, but maybe also you should consider a proximal virus osteotomy to recenter the hip. And the message, very important message in pediatric orthopedics, you should not do a pelvic osteotomy until you have centered the femoral head. Generally, we are going to go uh, this uh, uh, quickly now. So you have done the, what is the problem? That's the co presenting complaint. You have done your analysis. You know where is the problem is. What are the expectations of the family? What do you ex they expect? Relief of the pain, return of ambulation, mobilization. That is extremely important. What can you do with your surgical intervention? Can you address all the expectations of the family? Again, it's extremely important. Sometimes the expectations are out of uh, reality. And then after this, how can you reach these goals that you have discussed and defined with the patient and with the uh, family? We can reach these goals by acetabular procedure, femoral procedures combined ones, and by procedure, it's not only osteotomies, there are several other things that you are going to see that you can do. So the plan when I uh, put this lecture is to go through a list of 12 problems or 12 scenarios. Probably we'll not have time to uh, do all of them, uh, but we'll see how it will go. The first list, the most important one, is acetabular dysplasia. And acetabular dysplasia, a big, big uh, problem in pediatric orthopedics, uh, starting from DDH, as you can see uh, here, with a DDH is defined as deficiency in anterolateral coverage. However, it's much more than a pure anterolateral uh, coverage. It can be a acetabulum that is very shallow and large and that's typical of neuromuscular disorders where they are born with a normal hip and then because of the muscle imbalance they sublux. Or it could be a lateralized acetabulum. We can see here there is a very severe acetabular dysplasia. It's a very shallow acetabulum. The head is uncovered and that's a common thing that we see in adolescence or idiopathic dysplasia. Uh, we can also see a false acetabulum in cases of neglected DDH. So there is a whole spectrum of acetabular dysplasia. If you follow what you initially said, what is the problem, what is the radiological assessment, uh, then we proceed uh, with the next step. Why do you treat acetabular dysplasia? If the patient doesn't have uh, symptoms, does it need to be treated? Definitely it needs to be treated because we know now that if you leave this, that's what will uh, result. So acetabular dysplasia has to be uh, treated. Why it has to be treated? That's a drawing that is taken by Tashidian book on hip disorder. It's a very old book. Uh, however, it remains a standard thing. If you look at this, that's the normal weight bearing area of the femoral head and under the acetabulum. And it was measured, the pressure is equal to six kilopascal per centimeter. In case of dysplasia, the weight bearing area is irregular. Uh, because of the dysplasia, the weight bearing is concentrated on a much smaller segment, which increases the pressure on the acetabulum hugely. And this uneven distribution of weight bearing will lead to an unequal pressure, and that will lead to early degeneration of the articular cartilage. Therefore, the question is how to restore this normal weight bearing area uh, to the acetabulum. And one way is pelvic osteotomies. So pelvic osteotomies, in general, what is their goal? Increase coverage of the femoral head. This will normalize the pressure across the hip joint. 
and this will delay or prevent degenerative changes. That's the whole goal of the pelvic osteotomy in children and adolescents. The next step now is there are many types of pelvic osteotomy. Can you classify them and can you group them so that you have an idea which type of pelvic osteotomy you should do? So generally speaking, Pelvic osteotomy can be subdivided into osteotomy that change the orientation of the acetabulum or they change the shape and the size of the acetabulum. These are the two big subgroups. The change the orientation of the acetabulum, they are the redirectional osteotomies. And the redirectional osteotomies, we have the Salter, the Double, the Triple, the Wagner, and the Gans osteotomy will go in quickly through them. Uh, I don't know if that is... Uh, So the redirectional osteotomy, you change the direction of the acetabulum without changing anything in the shape and the size. After this, this the other uh, group we have, you change the shape and the size, can be subdivided into two. Either you use extra-articular bone to augment the existing acetabulum, and these are called the salvage procedure. Why? Because you are not using the higher line articular cartilage of the uh, acetabulum. And the big other group, it is the incomplete osteotomy, what we call the acetabuloplasty. And by these, you use the articular cartilage of the acetabulum to reconstruct it. So what are the salvage procedures uh, that we have? Number one, it is the Chiari osteotomy. And the Chiari osteotomy, that's where you do your cut, you medialize the whole hip joint, and this now covers the whole uh, femoral head. It will not change into high line articular cartilage, but it will develop a, cap a capsule there and uh, it will cover the femoral head. It's much more performed in Eastern Europe than in North America. I don't know here if it is performed or not. It's an excellent osteotomy. It's not really considered a salvage. It can, it can give a huge coverage to the femoral head, almost 100%. Uh, the other type of the salvage procedure, it is the uh, uh, shelf uh, procedure. And the shelf procedure, it is not really an osteotomy. What do you do is you add some bone graft here to increase the coverage of the femoral head. It's an excellent procedure. Again, it's not considered a shelf. It's done more and more now in cases of Persis disease, in cases of CP, with uncoverage of the femoral uh, head. The last big subgroup, which are the acetabuloplasty, and that's you change, again, the shape and the size of the acetabulum. And here, it includes the Dega osteotomy and the Pemberton osteotomy. And essentially, what do you do? It's, a, uh, it's an opening wedge osteotomy of the acetabulum. So you have your acetabular roof, you do your cut here, you don't complete the whole cut, you lower the acetabular roof, and then you put your bone graft. The Dega osteotomy or the Pemberton, there is lots of description. What is a Dega? What is a San Diego Dega? What is a true Dega? It doesn't matter. The principle is that it's an opening wedge osteotomy of the roof of the stabulum to lower it and then cover. So that's it. There are two important slides in his whole lecture. <coughs> that's one important slide. If you can figure it out, uh, all, most of the types of pelvic osteotomy fall under one of these four uh, groups. The next thing that you should uh, really know is what are the indications, what type of coverage each one can do, what age, and where does it hinge. So we'll try to go quickly uh, through, any, uh, through these things. Before I continue, any question on this classification of type of osteotomies? Okay. So we'll talk a bit about the redirectional osteotomy. And as I mentioned, you don't change anything in the acetabulum itself. You just change the direction. And we have five main uh, groups, the Salter. The double now is almost history. I don't think anyone uses it. 
triple, we will talk about a bit about the triple, uh, triple the spherical or the Wagner osteotomy. Again, it's history. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the periacetabular or the Gans osteotomy. So the first one, which is the most popular osteotomy, it's uh, Salter osteotomy. Uh, he was the chief in Toronto, a big name in pediatric orthopedics. He developed it initially for DDH. It increases the anterior and lateral coverage, and we are going to see uh, how. The most important thing is that it decreases the posterior coverage, therefore it's contraindicated in neuromuscular uh, conditions because most patients with CP arthrogryposis are sitting and they need the posterior uh, coverage. You need a concentric reduction. As a prerequisite for any redirectional osteotomy, you need a concentric reduction. The osteotomy, it's not to reduce the hip, it's only to cover a hip that is already has been reduced. You need at least 30 degree abduction before you do your osteotomy, that's the age, and it can only correct a mild type of dysplasia. That's your standard bikini incision uh, that you do, and that's a very important uh, thing. I hope it works. Okay, so here is your cut. And then you increase lateral coverage and you increase the anterior coverage. <laughs> if you don't do this maneuver to increase the anterior coverage, then you missed the whole uh, aim of the osteotomy. How do you know that you have increased the anterior coverage and the lateral? If you look at the obturator foramen, at the beginning they are the same. After you have done your anterior maneuver here, they are not the same. And if after your osteotomy or the x-rays, both obturator foramen are the same, then essentially you, you don't know what you are doing and it was not a solter osteotomy. Where does it hinge? It hinges here on the symphysis pubis. So after this symphysis pubis, after the age of adolescence, in theory, you cannot do a solter osteotomy. So again, you cover anterior and lateral, but with this maneuver, you uncover posteriorly. Therefore, not indicated in neuromuscular uh, patients. So that's quickly the solter osteotomy. You cut the uh, iliopsoas, you take here uh, your, uh, that's the jiggly saw that is always uh, used. You take a piece, a triangular piece of bone graft from the iliac crest, which is this, and then you put it in the osteotomy site and you hold it. Always threaded K wires, never smooth K wires. And you use this maneuver to interiorly displace uh, the cut. It's used for mild type only of dysplasia. That's a typical indication in case of DDH. At the age of two years, you do your open reduction. Following your open reduction, you do a solter osteotomy. Do you have to do a solter osteotomy here? It's controversial. Some people say, well, leave it and give it a chance for the astablum to remodel. It does not remodel before the age of four or five, then you do your osteotomy. Most other people say you are already there, you have the exposure, do a pelvic osteotomy. The other also indication, it's a uh, Persis disease where Salter osteotomy still remains one of the gold uh, standard. Can you do it after adolescence? Yes, but I think it's mostly in Toronto that, uh, that still do it. Typically it's until adolescence only. Uh, there is this diagram which is very important, it's the survival, and by survival they mean at what age do they have to convert them to a total hip, and the survival you can see here after 10 years it's almost 100%, 20, 30, it's only after the age of 40 years that it starts to drop. Nothing up till now was able to beat these results, uh, probably because no pelvic osteotomy has as long follow-up, but the Salter osteotomy remains the gold standard in pediatric orthopedics for many, many conditions. Next, we'll go to a, uh, that's how we'll skip it, triple osteotomy. Triple osteotomy were devised in case the Salter cannot correct moderate or severe dysplasia. There are three cuts. You have your first cut, which is a Salter cut, and then you have your second cut here, 
and the third cut here. So that this fragment now becomes completely mobile except for ligamentous attachment. But you can do a huge uh, coverage uh, with this uh, osteotomy. It is dangerous if you don't know what you are doing that you externally rotate the whole leg. Now something very important that was mentioned this morning by James, it's the ligamentous attachment uh, here. And if you look at this, there is a sacrospinous ligament, sacrotuberous ligament and the sacrospinous ligament that are still holding your bony fragment. And where you do your ischial cut uh, will tell you how much mobility your, your fragment will have. If you do your cut here, like the standard steel osteotomy, if you do your cut here and the other one, I will go back one second. If you do your cut here, okay, these two ligaments are still attached. Therefore, your fragment is not completely mobile. To obtain more mobility, you do your cut here. So by doing your cut here, you have eliminated the action, the restricting action of this ligament. However, it's not completely full. If you do your cut here, which is more and more towards the acetabulum, towards where the deformity is, then your fragment is completely freely mobile. The only thing here is that it's not easy to get there. It's much easier to get here. But the principle is that the nearer you do your cut near the acetabulum, the freer uh, you get. Forget about the names. One is a, a triple osteotomy, Le Coeur, or Tunis, or Steel. It doesn't uh, really matter. So that's about the triple. You never do this maneuver while you're doing a triple because the external rotation is not controlled and you, you may end up, the patient showing up in the clinic walking uh, with an external uh, rotation deformity. And a typical indication, again, is Peirce's disease that you think, for example, has severe dysplasia, then you do a triple osteotomy. Wagner, I will not mention it because no one is using them, so forget about this thing, at least in North America. Then we come to the periacetabular or the Gans osteotomy, popularized by Gans from Bern in Switzerland in 1988. And the, uh, it's very important to know the principle of the Gans osteotomy. So you do your cut here, here, and here. And the last cut, which is the blind part of the cut here, uh, you maintain the, post the integrity of the posterior wall of the acetabulum. And that's the whole idea of the guns. So that you have a free fragment here, completely free. There is nothing attached to it. But you have preserved the integrity of the pelvic wall. So it's a stable osteotomy. It doesn't need any mobilization afterwards. And this uh, free fragment, uh, you can cover anything with it. It's the most powerful osteotomy. You can cover anteriorly, you can do a reversed GANS, you can cover posteriorly, you can do anything uh, with it. Uh, however, said it's not an easy osteotomy to do. There are part of it that are blind cuts and you have to be careful because here around this area, there are vessels, nerves that you don't want to see, you don't want to uh, damage. It's almost, it has almost replaced the triple uh, osteotomy in many uh, cases. A typical indication, adolescents with a uh, acetabular dysplasia. In the previous time, we used to treat this with a triple osteotomy. Now it's a periacetabular organs osteotomy uh, that we do. So after fusion of the triradiate cartilage, it has almost completely replaced uh, the triple. You don't do it with a uh, open triradiate uh, cartilage. That's the second slide that is most important. If you remember the first slide and this slide, then uh, I think I would be very happy. So this essentially, it summarizes all the pelvic osteotomy. And the way I look at it is that that's the three groups that we talked about. It's the redirectional, the acetabuloplasty, and then the salvage. That's the age where it can be done, and the age where it can be done depends on where does it hinge. The coverage, we uh, quickly, we said the Salter cover anterolaterally, uncover posteriorly. Triple and the guns cover any amount of dysplasia. The Salter hinges on the symphysis pubis. Here there is no hinge, so there is no age limit where you can do this osteotomy. The degree of correction 
It goes from mild, powerful, and the most powerful osteotomy, it's the GANS. One important thing here that I've added, it is the femoroacetabular impingement. If you go crazy, can it cause a femoroacetabular impingement? And all of these, yes, they can cause femoroacetabular impingement. The next two are the acetabuloplasty, the DEGA and the Pemberton. It's before fusion of the triradiate because they hinge on the triradiate uh, cartilage. And then you have your salvage procedure. At any age, they do not hinge on uh, anything. And they said the Chiari is also a powerful osteotomy. It can cover almost 100%. Uh, percent. So this gives you a summary. If you know this and you know the pathology, then you can decide which type of osteotomy uh, you can uh, choose. So I think it's, I will just say one uh, few words on this. It's part of the uh, workshop. So your DEGA osteotomy, it's a very, very common osteotomy that you do in CP in your muscular condition. Essentially what it is, uh, here is your osteotome that you go about uh, one to two centimeter above the acetabulum. You go only on the outer table and that's the DEGA osteotomy described according to the San Diego people. It's not the true, true DEGA, but that's commonly called the DEGA or a lateral acetabuloplasty. Then with your osteotome, you go towards the triradiate cartilage. Uh, the next step, you uh, use your osteotome as a joystick, you use a laminar spreader, and that's the amount of coverage that you can get. You can never overcorrect with the DEGA, so don't be afraid of pushing down. Uh, you can break the triradiate cartilage here, but it doesn't really cause any consequences. And that's your opening wedge osteotomy of the acetabular uh, roof. And then you put your bone graft. You can play with your bone graft if you want more posterior or anterior coverage. And that's the final uh, result here. It gives an uh, excellent global coverage. It's the only osteotomy that covers anteriorly, laterally, and posteriorly. And that's why it's indicated it's the best option in neuromuscular condition with a global uh, deficiency. Typical indication a CP patient with a very shallow acetabulum. Uh, you do your DEGA and then you do your VDRO uh, also. Pemberton osteotomy, I just mentioned the principle. You do two cuts, one in the inner table and then you do one in the outer table and then it's the same thing, it's an opening wedge of the uh, acetabulum and it gives a huge anterior coverage as you can see here. Many people are using it for DDH where there is an anterolateral uh, deficiency. Uh, I will finish this part with the two salvage, the Chiari and the uh, shelf procedure. Many types of shelf procedures. Okay? I think there are more than 60 types of shelf procedure. They are not osteotomy. All what you do is you put a bone graft to cover the uncovered uh, acetabulum. The, the one that is mostly used has been described by uh, Rick Bowen and that was at the DuPont Institute. And the first thing, you take a piece of bone from the inner uh, side of the table and that will be essentially what you cover uh, your femoral head. Then you drill a sort of a trough here in which you are going to put uh, your bone graft. You insert it and that is your piece of bone graft. You add here cancellous bone and that will be the coverage of your hip. An excellent procedure. It's not an osteotomy. There is no blood loss. It gives excellent results. The only thing is that you have to suture this to the capsule. There must be some weight bearing here, otherwise the bone graft will resolve. And that's the end uh, result. Uh, the, also, you have to be careful. If you go crazy about this, then you can cause also impingement. So intraoperatively, you have to make sure that there is no uh, impingement. And that's the uh, end result. I will finish with the Chiari, an excellent procedure. However, technically you have to uh, follow may, very minute details. Your cut has to be 10 to 15 degree, just, just over the acetabulum. 
and there is a high KRE, there is a low KRE, but the principle is uh, this, and in the workshop, that's your cut, that's the complete cut. You medialize the hip by pushing it here inside, and that's after this how it looks like, and then you fix it with two threaded uh, K wires, and that's the result. As I mentioned, an excellent procedure should not be considered as a salvage uh, procedure. The beauty of the KR is that you can do it on a sublux tip, on a dislocated tip. It doesn't need to be uh, centered and it works uh, very well.